Today's presentation is Strategic Application of PBPK Modeling for Predicting DDIs and the Effects of Smoking and Organ Impairment. Our speakers today are Dr. Karen roland Yeo and Dr. Lei Sun. Karen is currently a Senior Vice President of Client and Regulatory Strategy at Sertara, where she leads projects leading, relating to the extrapolation of in vitro data to, protect, to predict in vivo PK in humans. This has included the development and implementation of models into the SimSIP simulator. Karen's research interests include PBPK modeling and the prediction of drug-drug interactions. Lei is currently a Vice President of Clinical Pharm Pharmacology and Translational Medicine at Cogent Biosciences. She brings more than 20 years of experience in the biopharmaceutical industry. In today's webinar, she'll share her experience of utilizing model-informed drug development to support the clinical development and FDA approval of Libaldi, lanzapine samidorphin, for the treatment of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. Lay holds a doctorate in chemistry and chemical biology and a master's in in chemical and biochemical engineering from Rutgers University in New Jersey, and she holds a bachelor's degree in material sciences and engineering from the Tianjin University in China. Lei and Karen, welcome to the webinar. I'll now turn it over to Karen to begin the presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Suzanne. Okay, so uh, what we've got on the agenda for you today is uh, Lay is going to start by giving you background to the Alzam project and also talk about the uh, ClinFarm strategy and where to integrate PBBK modeling. And this is going to be with respect to um, DDIs and also organ impairment. And then I'm going to switch over and talk more about the PBBK modeling side of things and focus on DDIs and special populations. We're going to talk a little bit about the impact on the label and the FDA review for relating to this project. And then I'm going to finish off with some key messages and learning points from the uh, OLZAM project. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Leigh. Thanks, Karen, and uh, thanks the uh, organizer at the uh, uh, Sotero for inviting me to participate in this uh, webinar. Uh, I, uh, I want to say, uh, although I just joined the uh, uh, Cogen Biosciences uh, recently, this work uh, uh, we're going to present today is uh, the, the work I have uh, uh, done in uh, Alchemies. I worked there uh, for eight years prior to moving to Cogen uh, recently. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction to the olanzapine semidorphin combination product called the OSEM, brand name Labalvi, and share with you uh, our experience of uh, integrating PBPK modeling into ClinFarm uh, strategy to support uh, clinical development and uh, regulatory interactions leading to the product approval. OSAM is a combination of uh, olanzapine and semidorphin, uh, was approved uh, last May for uh, the treatment of uh, schizophrenia and bipolar 1 disorder. Olanzapine uh, is uh, an atypical antipsychotic, uh, has been in use for the past uh, 20 plus years and provides an effective treatment option for patients with uh, schizophrenia and bipolar 1 disorder. Although olanzapine has uh, been considered as one of the most effective uh, antipsychotic agents, its clinical utility has been limited by significant weight gain and the metabolic effects associated with its use. Semidorphin is a new molecular entity developed by Alchemies. Uh, it acts as a Obia receptor antagonist. In our uh, late phase uh, uh, efficacy studies, the addition of semidorphin to olanzapine uh, mitigated uh, olanzapine associated weight gain while preserving the antipsychotic efficacy of uh, olanzapine. As shown uh, in the left hand figure here, this is the weight data from. Uh, uh, our phase three, the, uh, free, uh, phase three studies. The patients treated with uh, olanzapine semidorphin combination as depicted uh, by the 
uh, green line here had significant less weight gain and the stabili uh, stabilization of the weight as compared to patients treated with olanzapine alone as depicted by the orange line here. The drug product uh, is an uh, immediate release bilayer tablet with one layer containing olanzapine and another layer containing semidorphin. The dose strengths approved for the product uh, contain the same uh, therapeutic dose range for olanzapine uh, in one layer and a fixed dose of 10 milligram semidorphin in the semidorphin layer. Uh, next slide, please. Since uh, olanzapine has been on the market for 20 years, so its uh, ADME properties uh, has been well characterized uh, during uh, its development and approval. We know olanzapine is well absorbed and reaches uh, uh, maximum plasma concentration in about six hours. Uh, after oral dosing with a half-life of uh, about 21 to 54 hours. Uh, olanzapine displays uh, linear PK over the clinical dose range of 2.5 milligram to 20 milligram, and the, its clearance is known to be affected by smoking status and the gender with higher clearance in smokers than non-smokers and higher clearance in males than females. Olanzapine is extensively metabolized in the liver with uh, less than 10% uh, of the uh, administered drug recovered in urine as unchanged drug. Its primary metabolic pathway are uh, uh, direct glucuronidation via uh, UGT1A4 and the sib needed uh, oxidation mainly by CYP1A2. It is a highly uh, bind to plasma protein with 93% bond uh, across the therapeutic uh, uh, concentration range. The ADME properties for semidorphin was originally uh, evaluated in a number of uh, uh, semidorphin alone uh, phase one uh, clean farm studies and in uh, some in vitro ADME uh, studies. Semidorphin is rapidly absorbed uh, with, uh, that reaches the maximum plasma concentration within one to two hours uh, after oral dosing with half-life of uh, six to nine hours. Uh, the PK of semidorphin is linear across the dose range of 2.5 to 20 milligram. There was no apparent effect of food, age, or gender on semidorphin PK. Semidorphin is eliminated uh, primarily uh, via CYP3A4 mediate uh, uh, hepatic metabolism and uh, renal clearance with 20% of uh, uh, semidorphin eliminated unchanged in the urine. The plasma, plant, plasma protein binding for semidorphin is low uh, with uh, 30 to 33% uh, and the binding is uh, not concentration dependent. Next slide, please. With uh, uh, these uh, initial ADME data and the existing uh, physical chemical properties uh, for uh, both olanzapine and the semidorphin, we initially developed uh, P, uh, separate PBPK models for olanzapine and the semidorphin, as Karen will uh, go over with you uh, in more details. Using the uh, PBPK model, we predicted that there's no potential for drug-drug drug interaction between the component uh, of olanzapine and semidorphin in the combination product, which is uh, consistent with the distinct metabolic pathway for olanzapine and semidorphin, and also consistent with the clinical data observed in our early POC study, which showed similar CMAX and AUC of either drug when administered alone or uh, co-administered with the other drug. We know CYP1A2, uh, it's a major CYP enzyme involved in olanzapine metabolism. However, 
since the semi-dwarfin is not metabolized by CYP1A2, and the impact of the CYP1A2 modulation on olanzapine PK was well characterized during its development and the approval, and there's no DDI between olanzapine and the semi-dwarfin, so we felt uh, there's uh, no need for additional clinical studies to evaluate the uh, CYP1A2 modulation on uh, impact of uh, uh, olanzapine and semidorphin. On the other hand, uh, uh, since uh, semidorphin is the only uh, uh, NCE component of the combination and the uh, uh, metabolism of semidorphin is predominantly mediated by CYP3A4 and impact of uh, CYP3A4 mediated inhibition and uh, induction on semidorphin PK was unknown at the time. So we felt the DDI study may be required to evaluate the effect uh, of uh, strong uh, CYP3A4 inhibitors and strong inducers on semi-PK. Uh, so uh, one thing I want to, uh, I think worth mentioning here, uh, I am sure Karen will go into more detail, is that uh, well, uh, being developed uh, in combination with uh, uh, olanzapine uh, as a treatment for uh, uh, schizophrenia, uh, semidorphin was also being developed in combination with another approved drug called uh, buprenorphine uh, for, uh, as a potential treatment uh, for major depression disorder. And so, and in that combination, buprenorphine and semidorphin combination was uh, developed as a sublingual uh, tablet because the poor oral bioavailability of uh, 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 buprenorphine and also the intended therapeutic dose in that combination was two milligrams sublingual uh, semidorphine as compared to uh, the therapeutic dose of 10 milligram oral for semidorphine in the olanzapine semidorphine combination. So. Um, despite uh, the difference uh, in terms of uh, route of administration and the therapeutic uh, dose for semidorphin, the results from uh, our radio labeled human AME study actually uh, indicate uh, the absolute bioavailability of uh, semidorphin after sublingual administration and oral administration are uh, very similar, both around 20% bioavailability. And also we have uh, uh, clinical data indicate uh, PK linearity for semidorphin uh, across the therapeutic dose from two milligram to 10 milligram across the two uh, indication. So uh, given that uh, our clean farm strategy for olanzapine and semidorphin was uh, developed by leveraging uh, existing clinical data for olanzapine and semidorphin as much as uh, possible and in, conjun uh, in conjunction with uh, PBPK modeling to inform uh, those recommendations for the combination product. So this slide here outlined uh, the clean farm strategy for DDI assessment. We uh, first uh, use the uh, existing uh, clinical data from uh, published olanzapine data, as well as the semidorphin data generated uh, from the, the buprenorphine olanzapine combination product to inform the PBPK uh, model development. So we know there was published data uh, with uh, uh, olanzapine in terms of uh, uh, the uh, impact of smoking on olanzapine PK, as well as strong uh, CYP1A2 inhibitor on olanzapine PK. For uh, the results from uh, uh, a DDI study with atriconazole with uh, uh, BIP semidorphin combination indicate a weak effect of atriconazole on semidorphin uh, exposure the increase in CMAX was negligible and the increase in uh, semidorphin AUC was up to uh, uh, 
fifty percent, and more importantly, the the the, the weak effect of uh, uh, strong SIP inhibition was accurately predicted by PK uh, PBPK modeling. As a result, it was uh, acceptable uh, by FDA uh, that we can utilize. Uh, the existing data and the PBPK modeling to prospectively uh, predict um, the effect of uh, uh, CYP3A4 uh, CYP uh, inhibition on the effect of semi dorfen without uh, conducting additional uh, DDI studies with um, with uh, uh, olanzapine uh, with the olanzapine semi dorfen combination product. So. Uh, the only additional DDI study we need to conduct was uh, uh, a DDI study uh, with uh, refunding, and that, uh, the data, clinical data from that study uh, was used to further verify uh, the PBPK model and optimize the, as, uh, as appropriate. And then the final PBPK model was used uh, to predict uh, the untested scenarios uh, in lieu of additional clinical study and all these uh, uh, different steps uh, eventually uh, used to inform label um, on olanzapine semidorphin in terms of a DDI. Next slide, please. So a similar strategy was applied for the organ impairment. Uh, here, uh, again, we uh, first, uh, leverage existing clinical data with olanzapine and semidorphin to inform the PPPK model. We know uh, on uh, the olanzapine label, there's no dose adjustment uh, for hepatic uh, uh, impairment based on clinical data, uh, a clinical study conducted in mild and moderate hepatic impairment, and uh, no dose adjustment for uh, olanzapine for uh, for renal impairment patient based on study conducted with a severe renal impairment. And the data actually from a renal and hepatic impairment study conducted with a buprenorphin, semidorphin uh, combination uh, indicated uh, a moderate increase uh, in semidorphin uh, exposure, and that effect was uh, accurately predicted uh, by PBPK modeling. So initially, we were tr uh, trying to uh, uh, ask we were if we can uh, uh, we don't have to conduct additional uh, uh, organ impairment study with the olanzapine semidorphin uh, combination product, but. Uh, at that time, the feedback we uh, got from the agency is that uh, using PBPK modeling to prospectively predict the drug PK in, uh, in subject with a hepatic uh, impairment and the renal impairment has not been systemically established. Uh, that was back in 2016. So, uh, so the agency asked us to still conduct uh, clinical studies uh, in uh, the renal and the hepatic impairment uh, uh, population. However, we could use uh, uh, the reduced the design, rather a uh, full study design. So we conducted the study as requested uh, using uh, reduced the design in a moderate hepatic impairment and uh, in severe renal impairment. So that data was uh, used to conform the PBPK model prediction and for the refined model and the final uh, PBPK model was then used uh, to pr predict uh, the untested scenario across different categories uh, of renal and hepatic impairment uh, in, uh, in lieu of uh, additional clinical studies. So I'm going to stop here and then uh, hand over to uh, Karen to go over in more detail in terms of uh, modeling simulation. Karen, take it over. Okay, thanks, Leigh. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the uh, PBPK modeling side of things, but what I don't want to do is take you through all of the different aspects because this was obviously quite a few um, years of work. What I want to do is just focus on some key messages and uh, key aspects of the project. So, um, 
obviously, I mean, this is a generic slide, but I think it's important to uh, recognize that, you know, when we're talking about applying PBPK in uh, drug development, you know, we can start in the uh, discovery arena, but for this particular project, you know, we had some uh, multiple dose exposure data also, uh, you know, starting PK. And, uh, you know, we had some idea of the uh, DDI potential, but essentially we started an early de development and then obviously um, had an iterative model by the time we got to late development for assessment of uh, drug drug interactions and uh, obviously informed the model as the new data sets emerged and then used it for organ impairment, exactly as Lays explained. But, you know, one of the things that I want to mention is that, you know, with respect to sa Samadorfan, obviously that was a new chemical entity. And in terms of um, assigning the FM uh, based on in vitro, assigning the FM set 3A4, it was initially based on in vitro metabolism data and the oral PK data for SAM. And then obviously, as Leigh mentioned, we had this DDI study with uh, itraconazole, but that was the sublingual uh, formulation. But in this particular case, we used it uh, to refine the model and the FM and essentially came up with um, this pie chart here where we had um, essentially equal contributions really of the renal, the SIP, uh, 3A4 mediated metabolism, and then uh, other pathways in there as well. So this is just very typical where we go through this uh, iterative process. I think what is interesting for me and probably uh, for you as well is that when we developed the olanzapine model, I mean, obviously it's a well-characterized, well-studied drug. Um, what we did was have a look in the literature to see what data were available in terms of the studies. And uh, when I did the uh, model development, I started with mass balance data based on IV and also the in vitro metabolism data as well. And uh, so basically went back to, um, you know, basics, uh, but the me me metabolites were very well characterized and therefore I was able to assign the uh, different routes. Then when I utilize this model prospectively to simulate the clinical DDI data that were available with fluvoxamine, and also look at the effect of smoking. I didn't have to refine the model. I was able to capture the DDIs and also the effect of smoking based on the FM values that had been assigned using the mass balance data and in vitro metabolism data. Interestingly, with Samadorfan, as I mentioned in the previous slide, we started off with the in vitro data and early PK data, and then we refined the FM on the basis of the um, clinical DDI study with itraconazole. But the point I'm trying to make here is that based on the mass balance data, when that came in, based on um, a, a IV data, and we utilized the in vitro metabolism data, if we'd have had the mass balance data uh, available at the outset in combination with the in vitro data, then we actually predicted very well at, um, using this model, the clinical DDI study with a triconazole and also the DDI study with uh, rifampin. So this is just making the point really that yes, with Samadorfan, what the model evolved as the data became available, but, you know, the mass balance data in conjunction with the in vitro metabolism data alone um, gave a good predictive model. So that's really all I'm going to say about the um, DDI side of things, except that obviously because the DDI study with itraconazole, um, the clinical data were available using the sublingual formulation, what we actually had to do using the PBBK model was show that we could bridge across the formulations. This is quite a complex figure. All I'm trying to show here is that when we're looking, um, you know, you, obviously you've got the oral formulation, which is the PO, you've got the IV formulation. When we're looking at sublingual, essentially what happens here is some of the drug can be swallowed. And in that particular case, it's treated exactly the same as an oral formulation would be. But also in terms of the sublingual, you get absorption across the oral mucosa, and then this would be treated exactly the same as IV data. So we had clinical data sets available for oral, IV, and also sublingual samadorfan. And as Leigh mentioned, I think the bioavailability was pretty good for IV and oral, but we were able to capture these using a PBBK model. And um, because we didn't actually have the, um, uh, because we don't actually, or didn't have a sublingual model, what I used was the inhalation model to mimic the sublingual route of administration. But really, this was a key step 
um, in order to be able to use the clinical DDI data with sublingual, we had to demonstrate that the model could bridge across the formulations. And this was important for the DDI side of things and also um, the organ impairment, which I'll come on to later. So when we're talking about PBBK modeling in patients with schizophrenia, I mean, obviously that is, you know, that is where the drug is actually being used. We have to be able to consider the um, population effects or disease-related effects. And uh, for those of you who are familiar with PBBK modeling, you'll be uh, very comfortable with this slide, where on the left-hand side, you know, we're looking at intrinsic and extrinsic factors and potentially their effect on the um, PBBK model. So we've developed, uh, obviously, the uh, compound file for uh, healthy volunteers for uh, Samador, Fanonolanzapine, and verified it. And now what we're interested in doing is looking at the exposures in patients with um, schizophrenia. So these um, data that I'm showing here are from a publication um, that uh, Lay was the first author on. But it's important because when we're trying to model a, a drug in, an, in another population or a disease population, we have to be able to try and reproduce the characteristics of those individuals in order to be able to look at the exposure. And I think one of the key things about that you will notice in this particular table here is the, is the tobacco use in a schizophrenic population. You can see here that in terms of current usage, you're looking at about 80, well, 67 to 86%. And some of these uh, individuals, uh, you know, were former smokers. So really what we're looking at here on average is about 80% of the um, patients with schizophrenia, I mean, are actually smokers. And therefore, it's important for us to be able to understand the impact of smoking. And uh, if you have a look at the reported data that were available for olanzapine itself, you know, and the impact uh, on clearance due to smoking, there are a number of publications uh, in uh, Callahan 1999, which is a review paper on olanzapine. There was a head-to-head -head study. And the um, increase in smokers relative to non-smokers was about 23%. But there have been a number of POP-PK analyses um, where, again, values, increasing values of about 45 to 55% have been cited. So in terms of actually modeling and, and um, you know, the um, increase in CYP1A2 abundance, you know, obviously, I mean, we needed a smoking population. Now, when we're talking about the uh, uh, developing a different population here, obviously there are lots of different um, system parameters within the SimSip simulator that you can modify. But what we found is looking at different populations and disease populations over the year, it, over the years, is that often it comes down to an, a, a handful of um, you know parameters really that can in fact. Uh, affect the exposure. And in this particular case, it's the CYP1A2 abundance. So there weren't available um, data available. And therefore, this was about 10 years ago. Um, what we did was uh, an, an, an analysis. Um, there were clearance data available in a population of about 863 um, Caucasians. And so, and based on the caffeine clearance was obviously related to the uh, cigarette consumption on a, on a daily basis. We extrapolated back to check to reflect the changes in CYP1A2 abundance. So if you have a look at this table on the uh, left-hand side here, you can see that um, in the default situation in non-smokers, we have a CYP1A2 abundance of about 52 uh, picomoles per meg of protein. And, um, in individuals where, who are smoking more than 20 cigarettes uh, per day, then this increase, increases um, to 94. So this was based on the analysis here. These data were then used prospectively to, um, well, to basically another simulation uh, was run to actually verify these, again, in the smoking population. And this is what we're showing here on the graph on the right-hand side. So we had these uh, abundance values available in a smoking population. So this is just showing a um, simulation here of single dose of olanzapine um, or the or exposure of, of olanzapine after a single dose of olanzapine cell and looking at the effect of increasing CYP1A2 due to smoking. Well, on the left-hand side in this table, you can see that we've got the 52, which is in non-smokers, um, but once we increase the CYP1A2 abundance value to 94, based on the previous, or the analysis I showed on the previous slide, then you can see that we get about a 23% reduction in AUC or, uh, due to an increase in clearance. 
The reason I've got this 156 on the bottom here is because essentially what I did was a sensitivity analysis to uh, determine what value I needed in order to be able to capture the larger um, changes in a in uh, AUC as a consequence of smoking, some of the results that I showed from the POP-P case study. But in effect, what we're saying is that based on the uh, value of 94, we get about a 23% reduction in the AUC. And um, similarly, the POP-PK model that was developed for, uh, uh, for lanzapine and samadorphan, you can see here that in this analysis, we're saying that uh, in smokers, there was a 30% increase in clearance um, when you're looking at the lanzapine P uh, PK, which is essentially similar to what we're showing here in the PBPK analysis. So moving forward now, um, looking at the olanzapine exposure in patients after dosing with um, Olzam, and uh, there was a lead-in period of olanzapine, uh, you know, up seven days up to 15 megs QD, followed by 14 days of once daily dosing. And what we're showing here on the left-hand side here is the olanzapine exposure in these, uh, in these um, individuals. So we're starting here from the first day of dosing of the uh, Olzam. And on the right-hand side here, you can see that on day eight and day 14, we're capturing the exposures reasonably well. And also, I mean, given the variability as well, I think we're predicting that pretty well. And on the right-hand side, what we're just showing you there is the CMAX and the uh, change, uh, sorry, in the AUC um, versus the predicted versus observed ratios. So in this particular um, simulation, we did consider the effects of smoking because obviously a high proportion of these individuals do smoke. But I think what is really important here as well is that, you know, we can also simulate the effects of smoking cessation. And of course, you know, this can happen when you've got subjects who are on olanzapine and also clozapine, which is another CYP1A2 drug. Then when a patient stops smoking, then you can have this bounce back effect where you suddenly get this increase in exposure and it's important to be able to um, actually model those. So what I'm going to do is um, change track now and switch over and start talking about organ impairment. And um, initially, I'm going to focus on the, the renal impairment side of things. And um, if you have a look at the uh, figures uh, on the right-hand side, dilanzapine and samadorphan, you can see these are just obviously showing the uh, contributions of the different clearance routes to the to lanzapine and samadorphan. And we know, um, you know, from um, you know studies that we've done ourselves, but also literature, that um, renal impairment. You know, we're not just talking about what happens in the kidney here. It has consequences. Uh, you know, affects really the uh, liver metabolism as well, and therefore. It's important to be able to consider these changes. And so, especially given that Samadorfan does have a strong uh, or a large CYP3A4 component uh, and also elanzapine itself. So, uh, these were the changes that were considered in the renal impairment population on the left hand side. And you can see that we're looking at um, a reduction in the CYPA and also UGT, also changes in the albumin levels and the creatinine clearance as well, which obviously will affect the renal clearance. So so these were the um, parameters that were considered in the following simulations. So if we have a look at this plot here, you can see that we've got a lanzapine on the top, that's in the uh, healthy age match uh, subjects. On the bottom, you can see that we've got an increase here. So this is in severe renal impairment, and we've got the observed data overlaid there. On the right-hand side, what we're showing you are the simulated versus observed um, changes in exposure. And on the right-hand side, the final column there, what we're showing you is that the simulated increase in uh, renal impaired subjects is 48% versus 51%, the observed value. And down at the bottom there, we're just showing the relative changes in the oral clearance versus the renal clearance, but there's only a small renal clearance component for olanzapine anyway. I think one of the key things that I want to mention here is that, um, you know, when we look, when we did the original simulations here, the predicted uh, FU value, um, you know, it was about 0.071 in, um, in healthy subjects. And what we're saying is that in a renal impairment, this increases to about 0.088. Now, this might not sound a lot, but essentially we are saying that there's a 25% increase here as a consequence of renal impairment. And when you map this out against a reduction in the SIP expression, the predicted um, uh, change that we got as a consequence of renal impairment was about 25%. But when we actually had the measured FU value from the clinical study and included those in the simulations, we ended up getting a pretty good prediction, as you can see here.
Now, focusing on the Samadorfan and the severe renal impairment here, you can see that again on the left hand side, we've got the changes we've got uh, as a consequence of renal impairment shown there on the bottom. And, uh, and in terms of the renal impairment relative to healthy changes in CMAX and AUC, you can see that we're predicting uh, reasonably well here. I think what is important uh, as well and not often shown in uh, case studies is that what we, we've got here is we've got the renal clearance component and then the oral clearance, which obviously consists of all the different clearance mechanisms. And what we're, we're predicting here, the relative reduction reasonably well for both the um, but for both the metabolism component and also the uh, the renal clearance component here. And again, because uh, Samadorfan, the uh, fraction unbound is quite high anyway, you're not really going to see much of a change whether you actually look at the uh, predictors or the observed um, values. So what we're doing now is moving on to the uh, hepatic impairment study. And as you'll remember from Lay's slides, um, for the for the renal impairment, we uh, as it was a severe uh, renal impairment study that was conducted, but in the case of hepatic impairment, it was uh, a moderate. And of course, within SIMSIP, we've got the child PUB model, which is actually used to reflect the uh, moderate hepatic impairment. And these data are, um, are being published uh, in, as an indicator on the left-hand side. So if we have a look at these figures in front of us, we've got olanzapine and we've got uh, on the top and we've got samadorfin on the bottom. Olanzapine um, on the left is the healthy uh, age-matched subjects. And then on the right-hand side, you can see here that we've got the um, effect of moderate hepatic impairment. I think what is interesting to note is that uh, you can see that we get a difference in the um, Tmax and the Cmax when looking at olanzapine, but I'll come on to that more in the, uh, in the next slide. So this is showing the simulated versus observed data for moderate hepatic impairment. And what I'm going to do is focus on the right-hand side for the moment where we're looking at the AUC. So in the white, we've got the olanzapine data. At the bottom, we've got the samadorfan data. And when you look at the change in ratio or the effect of the moderate hepatic impairment, you can see that the observed data for olanzapine are 1.67 and simulated, we're predicting about 1.51. In the case of samadorfan, observed is about 1.52 versus 1.79. So the, the predictions are reasonable. I think what is interesting here is that if you have a look at the C-max um, and focus on the olanzapine one, you can see here that we're not, um, in terms of the simulated data, we're only predicting a 1.14 fold increase, and yet there was a two fold increase that was actually seen. And uh, my colleague, uh, Zoe Barter, um, she worked on the hepatic impairment side and, uh, and invested, uh, investigated a whole lot of different mechanisms um, for this. And and, um, and it, it is quite an interesting observation and, uh, and does need further attention, I think, in terms of the um, mechanisms involved. But really, it's not the focus of, of what I'm talking about here. I just wanted to bring your attention to that. And also to the fact that in terms of the Zyprexa label here, you know, hepatic impairment study was done in N equals six subjects, and it was revealed that it had a little effect on the pharmacokinetics. So um, nothing uh, exciting there. In terms of the exposure of Olzam at steady stage, you know, we're looking at in untested scenarios. Obviously, the clinical study was conducted in uh, patients with um, moderate hepatic impairment. And what we wanted to know was, um, you know, in switching to severe hepatic impairment, you know, what impact did it have? And obviously, these are at steady state. And you can see that in going from moderate hepatic impairment to severe hepatic impairment, there was uh, an increase in exposure. Well, um, for samadorfan, but not really for olanzapine. So what I want to do now is talk a little bit about the regulatory review. And I think what is really interesting here was that uh, you saw the simulations there for hepatic impairment. And also, uh, if you think back to uh, when uh, Leigh was talking you through the ClinFarm strategy for the organ impairment, she mentioned there that there was a discussion, um, you know, with the agency about whether uh, the sublingual data could be utilized in the different categories of hepatic impairment. And at that point in time, um, the answer was no. But if you have a look at the review here, you can see 
on the uh, top, uh, on the left-hand side there, in terms of the predicted versus observed data, data have been presented for healthy, mild, moderate, and severe hepatic impairment, and that is based on the uh, sublingual uh, um, samadorphan. Whereas, and then you can see here that presented is the single oral dose of 10 mg of samadorphan, and then based on the multiple doses here. But the model, because it had been bridged across the oral and uh, sublingual and demonstrated to work really well, the reviewer of this uh, particular model or particular PBBK work, uh, what they did was utilize the model and then uh, look at the predicted versus observed data. And you can see here that the, um, the predictions were, act uh, were actually um, pretty good when compared against the respective um, groups. So, you know, I think what is interesting here is that the reviewer's comment was that, um, you know, the same model was used, it was uh, for the sublingual formulation. And I think because of the, um, you know, the confidence here in the predictions for the sublingual formulation, they felt confident then in being able to apply um, this to the um, oral formulation. And I think it's also interesting to note here, and I'll come back to this point, that the review was completed on November 2020. So here you can see that in the label it states that, um, you know, based on PBK simulations, the predicted Cmax and AUC ratios um, with severe hepatic impairment were 2.1 and 2.2 respectively. I think also what is interesting as well is that when you look at the um, DDI with itraconazole, again, references made to the fact that uh, the model was able to bridge across the different formulations. And um, here you can see that we've got the IV, the sublingual and the oral data presented for um, different um, doses. And uh, here mention was made that, um, you know, because of the bridging across the different formulations, the, um, you, you know, that the, the, the accepted the predictions for the oral form formulation here. And in fact, in the label, it does state that based on PBK simulations, a strong inhibitor is predicted to uh, increase this um, by 25% for Cmax and 56% uh, for AUC. So I'm just going to finish off now with some key messages. And uh, one of the reasons that I mentioned the um, you know, the FDA review, uh, it was completed in November 2020. I think it's important to acknowledge now that, you know, the IQ paper on organ impairment came out in December 2020. So these data sets weren't available, um, you know, at the time, I think, when the review was being done. And so I think this is really, really important data that have come out now. And you can see that the number of compounds that were used in this analysis to have a look at the effect of uh, hepatic impairment and organ impairment is pretty high. Um, you know, the, um, in terms of the compounds, they were eliminated predominantly via metabolism, but there were varying contributions of renal clearance. And I think you can see here that based on the analysis, it indicates that, you know, PPPK predictions can help determine the need and timing of the organ impairment study and may be suitable for predicting the impact of renal impairment of PK drugs predominantly cleared by metabolism. And it may be used to support mild impairment study waivers or clinical study designs. And I think that is a really important message going forward. I think if we want to increase regulatory adoption of PBBK models for assessment of um, renal impairment or hepatic impairment, we have to disseminate and share these case studies. And that's why I think, you know, this publication from the IQ group was great. There are a large number of um, compounds in there. Um, also, um, that's why we want to share the example of the samadorphan and the olanzapine with you here. So some of the case studies that we've worked on uh, for the SimSip consultancy, um, these, um, so we presented it in the uh, webinar today, but also uh, it's indicated in these publications here. But also, I think it's important to continue advancing the science, and there are an increasing number of publications. And I think it's a combination of all of these factors that is going to help us to uh, to get, you know, the agencies to um, start, you know, taking I, I think considering PBBK uh, models for um, the effects of organ impairment. And I think these types of uh, presentations that have been occurring over the recent uh, over last year 
are really important, you know, where there were discussions between the FDA and also the IQ group. And, you know, it certainly, you know, from my perspective, the discussions seemed quite positive. You know, they involved by the, uh, you know, both these groups here. And I think they seem to be quite supportive of the use of uh, PBPK. But I also think it's important to recognize, you know, we know that more work needs to be done to refine the renal impairment models. But I think it's important to still ch um, share these case studies so that we can understand when they work and when they don't and when we need to uh, refine the parameters going forward. Um, uh, you know, most of you will be aware that, uh, you know, the, the FDA guidance, um, you know, was uh, released, I think the initial um, version and it, the, the initial guidance document. But I, I think it's important to make sure that we have more PBPK integrated in there, especially with the uh, emerging data sets from the past year. And, uh, you know, this is why my colleague and I, Eva Berglund, uh, you know, we had this uh, short publication here where we talked about an integrated approach for assessing the effects of renal impairment. And, um, and really, this is a figure that we published there, and we just wanted to indicate when we thought that uh, PBPK models uh, should be used for the assessment of renal impairment. And, and essentially, this chart reflects what we've talked about in this presentation today. So uh, this PBPK model that was developed for olanzapine and samadorphan was used in the initial stages to help with the um, you know, clinical study design, and that you can see that that's indicated in that uh, top publication there. The uh, model um, was uh, refined based on the observed plasma data once the uh, clinical data became available. And that's indicated in the second box here. And then once you've got to that point where you're pretty confident in your model for the assessment of organ impairment, then we can apply it to these untested scenarios. But also importantly, I think it's, you know, we need to recognize that, uh, you know, for these, there may be situations when we don't have anything other than PBPK. And this is where, I mean, it, 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 this is its strength, you know, because here's an example of where a PBPK model was used to actually predict a complex drug disease interaction. So so we're looking at the effects of disease and also a DDI as well and, uh, and Im implications for clinical practice. So really, this is an approach that we want to put forward. Um, but also, you know, I think one of the things about that uh, particular slide there um, that I showed previously it was that there we talk about a high fidelity PBPK model. And this was a phrase that um, Karthik Venkatakrishnan and I um, cited in this particular publication here. And what we mean by that is, what is, is when you're actually developing a PBPK model, we, and again, we want to make the point about the pivotal role of mass balance studies here, is that they're important for helping you understand the clearance mechanisms. Then if we've got uh, good in vitro data that can help us elucidate these different pathways, we could then have DDI data that help us build this robust model. But the point is, if we've got this high fidelity PBPK model where we understand the clearance mechanisms, we could develop a really good PBPK model that then can be used for these situations here where we're talking about assessing the exposure in special populations. So without further ado, I'd like to acknowledge the um, contributions of Lisa von Malt um, to this work here. Uh, she's been instrumental in applying uh, PBPK in, uh, you know, throughout uh, drug development, and also uh, my colleague uh, Zoe Barter, who is uh, who, who uh, worked on the hepatic impairment and did a great job there. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand you back to Suzanne now. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen and Leigh. Um, excellent presentation. We'd love for our audience to submit their questions to our speakers in the questions panel. So I see a couple have come through already. Um, can you discuss whether the, what, someone wants to know what was the impact of UGT1A4 induction by smoking on olanzapine PK? So that is something that we haven't, uh, that we didn't consider in the model. So obviously we had a, a big UGT component there, but in terms of the smoking, we just focused on the uh, CYP1A2. Got it. Um, question for you, Leigh. Can you tell us the mechanism of action for Samdorfin to mitigate olanzapine-associated weight gain? That's a good question. And uh, so, as I mentioned, the semidorphin acts uh, through the OBL system antagonism, and uh, 
uh, the OB system uh, plays a role in the food reward and the metabolism. So, uh, in fact, the exact um, mechanism of olanzapine associated weight gain is uh, uh, uncertain, but uh, we know it dysregulated the uh, food reward uh, in mesolimic uh, dopamine brain reward uh, pathway may contribute to ob uh, obesity. And then the uh, OB receptor modulates the food intake and uh, risk for uh, weight gain and uh, uh, adiposity. So, uh, so our hypothesis is uh, uh, the addition of an uh, OB uh, antagonist um, to a drug, to a CNS active uh, drug such as olanzapine may mitigate the uh, metabolic uh, dysregulation uh, that uh, leading to weight gain. Great, thank you. Uh, Karen, someone wants to know, um, they say in PBPK modeling for re renally impaired and hepatically impaired patients, should we run sensitivity analyses for some systems parameters in addition to drug parameters? If so, which parameters would you recommend? I think the, the key parameters um, to consider if you're wanting to run a sensitivity analysis, as I mentioned, when we're looking at special populations, especially for uh, organ impairment, it's a balance between the, um, between the binding, plasma protein binding, and also the uh, CYP enzymes. And as I mentioned there, for example, with the olanzapine, um, because we were predicting an increase in the fraction unbound, and yet the organ impairment decreases the, um, the CYP enzymes, you essentially get this balancing out effect. So the key parameters that I would focus on would be the protein binding and also the CYP enzymes. But I think the, um, but again, I think, you know, in terms of running a sensitivity analysis, I would only do that if there were various data sets that were available indicating a, a range of values that have actually been published. Thanks, Karen. Someone states the dose strength for olanzapine samidorphin consists of a, a olanzapine dose range in a combination with a fixed uh, dose for samidorphin. Why is the samidorphin dose fixed? Is it su sufficient to mitigate weight gain associated with a broad dose range for olanzapine? So I, I guess I can take this uh, question. So the selection of a 10 milligram semidorphin, uh, the fixed dose uh, is based on our phase, uh, phase two uh, dose range finding study. In that study, we evaluate uh, three dose levels of uh, semidorphin, five milligram, 10 milligram, and 20 milligram. The result of the study uh, indicated 10 milligram semidorphin provided the, the optimal uh, efficacy in terms of um, uh, weight mitigation with acceptable uh, safety uh, tolerability profile. The five milligram semidorphin dose uh, uh, is less efficacious as compared to uh, 10 milligram semidorphin in terms of uh, weight mitigation, while the 20 milligram semidorphin did not uh, further uh, increase the efficacy in terms of weight mitigation, and uh, the AE profile was slightly uh, worse with the 20 milligram. Makes sense. Someone wants to know if the impact of rifampin on a lanzapine PK was characterized. Yes, it, in fact, in our uh, uh, in our uh, clinical study conducted uh, with rifampin, we evaluate uh, we use the combination product. So, so the effect uh, rifampin on both olanzapine and semidorphin were characterized. We actually did see some uh, impact, not as much as the impact on semidorphin. That uh, could be due to because rifampin, uh, in addition to be a strong SIP. 3A4 inducer, it's also an inducer of uh, UGT uh, enzymes uh, and also a weak inducer of uh, CYP1A2, so which all contributed to the metabolism of uh, olanzapine. Yes, and if I can just say something there, that was something obviously that we modeled. And I think having the uh, clinical data allowed us to look at the uh, potential effects on the UGTs. Well, the PBVK model allowed us to differentiate between the UGT versus the uh, CYP enzymes. Excellent. 
Got a couple more questions. These are these are really great questions. Someone comments, excellent and incisive presentation. I think so too. Your successful approach to implementing PBPK simulation results in the product label is clearly impactful. Did you discuss the PBPK analysis plan and scope of applying the results into the label with the regulators prior to submission? If not, can you share your thoughts on, regarding the value of seeking regulators' feedback prior to submitting your PBPK analysis? So, Leah, I think it's important that you take that one. Yeah, I mean, during the entire drug development uh, uh, course for this product, we actually have uh, multiple uh, type C interactions uh, with the uh, regulators. Uh, well, I believe we actually had uh, like a, a five type C interactions uh, along the way. So initially we present our uh, clean farm development uh, plan at the end of phase two meeting. And uh, so with the emerging data from the buprenorphine semidorphin uh, combination product, uh, we actually uh, made some revision to our clean farm, but we want to uh, get agencies buy in. So each process of uh, like whether uh, just using the existing uh, semidorphin data from the buprenorphine semidorphine combination and uh, in conjunction with PBPK modeling, uh, can uh, we can waive the uh, study with the, the DDI with atriconazone and the olanzib semidorphin that was through the uh, agreement where from FDA and also the uh, organ impairment uh, study with reduced uh, uh, reduced design that was also acceptable uh, or based on the recommendation from the agency. So uh, through through the entire development uh, up to uh, NDA submission, we had closely worked with uh, uh, FDA. To get their feedback. Awesome. And I think, sorry, can I I just jump in there as well? And I think that's a really important point, Leigh, because I, I think, you know, what uh, well, we all have to recognize really is that, you know, this is an evolving field. Um, you know, I mean, we're talking about six years ago when, um, you know, when, uh, you know, Leigh was involved in those initial discussions. But now six years on, we've got more data supporting the, uh, the use of PVK modeling, I think, in organ impairment. And, you know, and that changes uh, not every six year, but on a on a on a yearly process. I, oh, sorry, on a yearly basis, I would say. So I think it's important to uh, consider those interactions because even if, if there was a publication saying three years ago, uh, perhaps the regulators didn't um, support PBPK, that could have changed, and therefore it is a moving target. And I think those discussions are really important. Those are great great points from both of you. Um, just got a, got a couple more questions before we wrap up. Um, someone wants to know what is the other 30% pathway for Samidorphin metabolism? So, Leigh, do you want to speak to the metabolism data? So, maybe, Karen, I let you to, 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 to uh, take that. I know. Okay. Uh, Yes, well, I, I, at the time, uh, uh, quite a few different um, um, experiments, in vitro experiments, were conducted to try and identify it. But, um, you know, I mean, I think, look, UGTs, FMOs, everything. So, um, not sure what the, um, what the, uh, what, what it was in the end, but it was certainly investigated. So in answer to your question, I'm not 100% sure what the other mechanism was, but it was investigated uh, via many different experiments. Great, thank you. Looks like we've got one final question. Can you comment on PBPK strategies to model drugs that have concentration-dependent protein binding in hepatic or renal-impaired populations? Ooh. That's a really interesting one. Um, so I don't have a lot of experience. Well, I mean, I have a lot of experience in terms of hepatic impairment, organ impairment and protein dependent, but not all three together. But um, I would certainly say that, um, you know, again, well, as, as mentioned previously, one of the really important points is the protein binding uh, levels in these individuals. And therefore, I would say that you would have to have the concentration dependence in um, both categories in order to be able to uh, model that or at least understand the impact. Wonderful. Um... Well, thank you so much, Leigh and Karen. This has been an excellent and, and really educational se seminar. And um, thank you so much to our audience. They asked some really great questions. And we'll just wrap up with a few closing announcements. 
want to invite everybody to our next webinar, which will be held on February 9th, when Dr. Sibylla Neuhoff and Dr. Sung Jo from Sertara will present Food Constituent Drug Interactions, Influence on Quantitative Modeling on Drug Labeling. And if you'd like to register for this webinar, you can come to the SimSip members area at sertara.com. On behalf of Sertara, I'd like to thank you for attending this presentation. Goodbye and have a great day. Thank you.